All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Miguel Reguero. It's uh, wonderful to have everybody here at DDW. Hopefully, everybody's having a great uh, If you're looking for the MASH presentation, uh, stay in this room, because this is going to be much more exciting. Uh, we're going to talk about IABD and IL-23. Uh, along with my colleagues, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, we certainly will have time for discussion. Uh, please feel free at the end. If you do have questions, we'll go through how to format those, but we would be open for any questions about IL-23 and IBD. So on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us today for this educational activity uh, called Visualizing the Future, Advances in IL-23 Targeted Therapies and the Treatment of IBD, which you're hearing quite a bit uh, about at this meeting. So the, today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, who's jointly accredited in providing continuing education for the clinicians worldwide. Um, I just want to make sure we're clicking through. OK, so follow us on Twitter at CME Outfitters for the upcoming CME, CE, Opportunities, Healthcare News, and more. Just to show in the back, can you guys hear me OK? I just want to make sure. Wave, good, yes, lots of hands flying up. Um, we have about 600 people also online. So I'll wave to our online participants. Thank you for registering and joining us today. Uh, this proves to be a great program. So without further ado, I'm Miguel Reguero. I'm chief of the Digestive Disease Institute, professor of medicine at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And sitting to my left is Jessica Allegretti, who's the medical director of Fusion Center, uh, director, director, director. Don't read all of them. Don't read all of them. Everything. <laughs> Jess, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. <laughs> And then to her left is Dr. Ed Loftus, the Maxine and Jack Zero Family Professor of Gastroenterology, specifically in IDD at Mayo Clinic. Hello. And then sitting to his left and is Angelina Collins. Angelina, welcome as well, a board-certified adult nurse practitioner, inflammatory bowel disease at UC San Diego. We also know that there are a lot of APPs online and in the room, so we think it's important that we have this collaborative effort and presentation between our physicians and our APPs as well. So welcome, Angelina. Thank you. So today we're going to evaluate the role of various pro-inflammatory cytokines in driving inflammation in the pathogenesis of IBD. I'd also like to take the opportunity, you're hearing quite a bit about IBD and cytokines at this meeting, so we're going to break that down a little bit more in detail tonight. Uh, we're also going to assess the potential clinical implications uh, of these uh, IL-23s, identify the role of IL-23 TH17 inflammatory axes, and then we are going to start with an audience response. So, this is a time where please pick up your iPads. If you haven't already logged in, you will see the questions here. Um, and these are too small for me to read, but these are going to be the top three. You can actually pick the, the questions, drag it up in the order of, of importance for you. Uh, top three uh, that you can, you can have at this point. Use the microphone. Yeah. How's that? Better? So just take a minute to top three questions, top three answers here, and then we'll uh, talk about this in a second. curious to hear what people say about this. Access is one of those uh, answers, and maybe our panelists, uh, when we see the uh, responses, can comment as well. All right, so um, <clears throat> what's the most difficult aspect for patient care? Pick your top three. So it looks like, um, what do you think, Ed? Number, so, so drug, drug positioning. positioning. Yeah, yeah so then there's three tied for second, right? Prior off, 
loss of response, lack of time with patients. Yeah, so I think uh, all of you are feeling the pressures of, and I, I kind of seen the body language of people in the room, this isn't surprising. So accessing the medicines, getting authorizations, time with the patients, but also still quite a bit of questioning around drug positioning. So Angelina, when we come to your section, this will be uh, good for us to discuss as well. So with that, I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Allegretti, who's going to present the first part of this. And for the AV um, people who are doing this, we're, we're not quite in sync on our screen, so you have that there. So Jessica, go ahead and tell us about the pathogenesis of IBD. So what we're looking at here is really, oh, my microphone is so much louder than yours. Um, so we're really setting the stage. Again, we're really gonna try to give you guys some good background on how these novel mechanisms work so that when you're thinking about which drugs to select, you'll have a better understanding of really what's going on even at the cellular level. And so what you're looking at here is a monocyte, a CD64 positive monocyte that's releasing a lot of cytokines that is essentially activating Th17 cells that's leading to downstream inflammation of the gut. And we're gonna go through this process in a little bit more detail. So if we think broadly about IBD pathogenesis, we know it's multifactorial. There are uh, various um, genes that have been associated with these set of diseases. We know there's environmental factors. The gut microbiome certainly has been implicated. And with regards to immunology, we know that immune dysregulation and skewed lymphocyte populations and altered cytokine production are simply playing a role um, in the pathogenesis of both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. We know that a lot of these cytokine connections overlap with a lot of immune-mediated diseases, and that's why we see a lot of overlap with regards to the medications that we use. We share a lot with our rheumatology and dermatology colleagues because these pathways overlap. And so we're here to really focus on IL-23. So why target IL-23 and IBD? Well, inhibition of IL-23 decreases mucosal inflammation and improves epithelial barrier integrity. Inhibiting IL-23 suppresses gut inflammation in T-cell-mediated colitis. And anti-IL-23 therapy preserves protective IL-17 gut function. And when trials of anti-IL-17 have been trialed, they actually lead to worse outcomes. So again, that's a mechanism that we do want to protect. So where does IL-23 come from? Where there are several sources, you can see here macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, all um, are IL-23 producers that have downstream effect on various cells that have IL-23 receptors. And IL-23 has been shown to be highly expressed in inflamed mucosa and IBD, and that's true for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis compared to healthy controls. So IL-23 drives development of inflammatory pathogenic Th17 cells. So let me show you what that means. So we have T-cell activation, which again leads to inducible Th17. And then you get sort of this downstream effect again of release of more cytokines and sort of this pathogenic Th17 inflammatory response. And you see upregulation of things like TNF um, and IL-22, IL-17, things that we know to be pro-inflammatory. All right, we're back to an audience response. So the next audience response, so think about this. You probably see in your practice a lot of patients who are on TNF inhibitors, and then over time, they actually lose response. I'm going to actually check something. Can you hear me better with this or with this? So use the microphone. Okay. Got it. All right. So this question is, which of the following is a potential cause of anti-TNF non-response in patients with inflammatory bowel disease? Drug interactions between anti-TNF agents and immunomodulators, heightened production of IL-23 and development of apoptosis-resistant T-cells, down-regulation of TNF-alpha receptors on monocytes, or maybe many of you in the audience are thinking, I don't know, and that's an okay answer. So we're going to do a pre, and then we're going to come back to this, and we'll do, do a post. So... For those patients where you use anti-TNF and they lose response or they don't have a response, why is that? Take a second, and then just when the time comes we do the post, I will call on you first to Incredible. see if they got it. 
Well, I'm going to te teach them. You're going to teach them, so it's <laughs> going to be nearly 100%. All right, so let's talk through how we think about this question. So are you guys seeing this? No, not yet. Okay, perfect. So IL-23 mediated resistance to anti-TNF. Anti-TNF responders, um, when, when patients respond to anti-TNF, what's happening is there's induction of apoptosis and resolution of inflammation. And so what we're seeing with anti-TNF non-responders is there seems to be an abundance of IL-23 around that actually leads these cells to be resistant to apoptosis. And so what you could imagine if that you had a patient who is not responding to anti-TNF or maybe lost, losing response, perhaps what is happening here is there's an abundance of IL-23. And so you can start to see why we're thinking about anti-IL-23s in combination with anti-TNFs for those who, have, who are non-responders or lost response to really boost that signal and increase that um, induction of apoptosis. So let's see, are we gonna get back to the question? All right, so Jess probably gave you the answer, but think about this. So <laughs> you're using a TNF, first-line therapy, you're not seeing a response, and the question is why. So take a second again to answer the question. Um, is this uh, drug interactions between anti-TNF agents and immunomodulators? Is this heightened production of IL-23 in the development of apoptosis-resistant T cells? Uh, is this down-regulation of TNF receptors on monocytes, or do you still not know? So take a, a minute to, to answer this. We'll see the responses, and then we'll have a bit of a uh, discussion. Jess, what do you think? Pre yes. and post. So I'm impressed with how many got it right in the pre. I think yes. this is actually a concept that you know I, I became aware of actually fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of you uh, got it right in the, in the post test, so that's great. So again, this is heightened production of IL-23 and the development of apoptosis resistant T cells. So um, I think what's interesting about this is as we're starting to think about combinations of therapies, this is a real, there's some real, you know, biologic plausibility as to why this combination might work. Are any of you guys using this combination yet in practice? Yes. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But Ed, I'm, I'm curious, let me ask you a question. So what, what Jess presented, and I think until recently, um, just in your practice, forgetting the data, what percentage of patients you started on a TNF inhibitor would you say you're not seeing a response to? So I think, I mean, this gets into the whole primary non-response versus secondary, but I, I think, you know, both in my practice and in trials, I think about a third of patients just don't respond. Um, and then, of course, there's the loss of response over time, which is various mechanisms, but yeah, about a third. Right, so I think from what Jess is showing us, a third of the patients that re don't respond, and we can't prove this because I guess Jess to ask you the question, is there any way now in clinical practice to measure uh, IL-23 level to say, okay, this is a patient is not going to respond to TNF, we should give them an anti-IL-23 uh, from the start? Yeah, I would say I, that is not, I would say, commercially available yeah. yet, ready. But I, I, I think as we're thinking about companion diagnostics and things to really help us make some of that positioning decision, as you guys pointed out, I, I struggle with that in certain patients as well. Having companion diagnostics like that to sort of understand who really is at risk here, I think will be incredibly helpful in the future. And then Angelina, when you're thinking, you see a patient in the office, Ted's point, you put them on a TNF inhibitor, whatever that may be, yep. they don't have any response. So their fecal calprotectin is so high, let's say they have Crohn's disease, they're not responding. Mm -hmm. um, question is, what are, what are kind of some of the thoughts, and maybe we should say Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, what are some of the thoughts on next-line therapy? 
I think it really depends on the patient, obviously, right? And I think it depends on how sick that patient is, how close are they to stepping into the hospital, you know, or do we have time on our hands? Are we really in trouble? Is this a really sick patient? And I think a little bit about, in some ways, about the same things I think that we all would answer in the way of, you know, where is their disease located and what are we thinking they're going to respond to best? I think when it really comes down to it at that moment, you know, we're probably making a decision with an anti-TNF failure between either going to IL-23 or thinking of a jack. Yeah, and I think to be fair balance for the audience, I, I really would break it down into those two options. But Jess, let's keep going on yeah. enhancing IL-23 inhibition. Awesome. All right, so now to get into a little bit more nuance about these molecules. So again, when we think about IL-1223, that is really anti-P40, which is a subunit that is present on both IL-12 and 23, whereas anti-IL-23 is our, our really anti-P19, which is a subunit specific to IL-23. Now, when you actually look at the structure of this, you've got the light chain at the top and you've got the heavy chain at the bottom. Now here are two fully human IgG mo molecules, and you can see on the left, you have a mutated heavy chain or FC chain compared to in purple, the native wild type chain. And this matters when we think about the, how these drugs actually work in humans. And so uh, if you look here, both of these bind with high affinity IL-23 in the periphery. We also we sort of mentioned this at the beginning, but again, we've got inflammatory myeloid cells, which are high producers of IL-23, and you can see here they're um, affecting downstream Th17 cells. But again, these inflammatory myeloid cells are a big source of IL-23. And so if we think about these cells, um, FC gamma receptors, what are FC gamma receptors and CD64 receptors? I'm sure you're potentially starting to hear discussions around CD64 and how does this help us think about these agents? Well, FC gamma receptors are surface receptors on immune cells that recognize that FC portion of IgG. So the part of the molecule that I just showed you that could be mutated or native, CD64 is the only FC gamma receptor with high affinity for IgG1. And so again, when we think about where IL-23 is coming from and where these receptors are, we know that these monocytes have CD64 receptors. And so what does this actually mean? Why does this matter? So again, here we see uh, an inflammatory myeloid cell with those CD64 receptors on it. And we see that these are cells that, that uh, are a source of IL-23. You see the IL-23 leaving the cell. And these IgG1 molecules that have the mutated uh, chain do not bind the cells that are coming, the IL-23 that is coming from the cell, because they are not binding on the CD64 receptor. Let's contrast that with the molecules that have the native chain. And what you can see here is that they do bind that CD64 receptor quite well. So they're able to capture that IL-23 as it's leaving that inflammatory myeloid cell. So really, you're getting sort of dual binding of IL-23, one from the native source and also in the periphery, as I showed you earlier. So again, CD64 expression in diseased IBD tissue is present. It's been shown that there is expression significantly increased in inflamed versus non-inflamed gut biopsies. All right, so for those that are DDW, uh, for those that are listening online, let's think about the next question and CD64. So the, the reason we're bringing this up is this potentially is a different mechanism of action. So if you look at the question and look at your pads and answer this, which of the following is true regarding the binding of affinity of IL-23s to CD64 receptors? So which of the medicines also works on CD64. Binding of CD64 occurs with only risinkizumab. Binding of CD64 occurs only with gaselkumab. Binding of CD64 occurs only with mirakizumab. Binding of CD64 occurs with all three, risinkizumab, gaselkumab, and mirakizumab, or I don't know. So CD64, so just beyond IL-23.
I think I don't know should be changed to like phone a friend, you know, right? <laughs> it's like IVD is a team sport, and so instead of like, I don't know, but let me ask someone that does know. F phone Jess for the <laughs> graphics. Actually, Jess, those graphics were outstanding. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, really good. If you want the graphics, I think you guys can get them after this, so for teaching down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we will come back to this question. Jess is going to teach you a little bit more about CD64 and potentially what medication would work on this. Perfect. Okay, so let's get into this. So we've sort of set the scene. So now let's actually talk about actual drugs. So gazelkamab and rizinkizumab are both monoclonal antibodies that selectively target the P19 subunit of IL-23, as we've discussed. Gazelkamab and rizinkizumab have shown efficacy in the treatment of inflammatory bowel diseases. And potential differences, however, in the therapeutic profiles may be related to their unique molecular attributes. Both gaselkamab and rizinkizumab have differences in the FC region that affect binding of the FC gamma receptors. So as we just, just went through, now we can actually see how this applies in real life. So gaselkamab has that native wild type um, chain, FC domain, which does bind to CD64, whereas rizinkizumab does not. And so when we look at in vitro analyses um, and quantification of, again, that intracellular IL-23, um, we see that you have uh, high affinity binding with gaselkamab and not with rizinkizumab. Now you might be asking, what about mirakizumab? Where does this play in? Now mirakizumab is a humanized IgG4 monoclonal antibody that selectively binds to the P19 subunit of uh, IL-23 as well. Um, the IgG4 isotype containing the hinge stabilizing SP mutation. So again, this also has a mutated FC domain. Um, and so mirakizumab um, also again was modified, so it has reduced binding to CD64 or that those FC gamma receptors. So there's reduced potential for the thought of why these have been mutated, in case you were wondering, is there is thought to be potentially reduced potential for unwanted interactions with the immune system, although we've seen across this class, this does seem to be a very safe mechanism of action. But when these drugs were being developed, this was a hypothesis. And so that's why you do see some differences in terms of those mutations. But again, when the in vitro analyses have been done with mirakizumab, we see the same signal that I just showed you with rizinkizumab. You don't have um, that intracellular binding like we see with gaselkamab. All right, so this is the follow-up to the question, and then I'll call on all three of you, but Jess, I'll start with you when we see the answer. So what would you say? Which of the following is true regarding the binding of affinity to IL-23s to CD64 receptors? So this is talking about the CD64 receptor. Binding of CD64 occurs only with rizinkizumab A, only with gaselkimab B, only with mirakizumab C, or all three D, and there's still the I don't know at the bottom. And just hopefully you've taught everybody, but the CD64. So music, a couple seconds, and then we'll have a discussion. And just when we come out of this, I'll ask you a mechanistic question, but then Ed, I'm gonna talk about what this means practically, and Angelina, how, how would you describe this? So what's the big deal? I think it's a little slow. I really turned it up on that. <laughs> it's Van Morrison, right? All right. Yes, great. Okay, so Jess, what do you think? What was the right answer and how did they do? Yes, so the audience got it correct in the post. I'm impressed with how many got this in the pre as well. So the correct answer is B, binding of CD64 occurs only with gazelkamab. And then Ed, you know, from a mechanistic standpoint, Obviously, we're coming into a crowded market. We're going to probably have three IL-23s, not all for ulcer plays, not all for Crohn's, but over time, we may see with both. What does this binding of CD64 mean for you in, in kind of clinical practice? Well, I, I mean, mechanistically, it might increase the binding of um, IL-23. Um, but you got to see the data, right? Yeah. Like we have to look at the clinical data and and compare. Well, 
compare across trials and see if there's any signal, if there's any qualitative difference between uh, the results in these trials. And we just have to, I mean, it's, it's, it reminds me a little bit about the old 5ASA, you know, like, show me the data that one is better than the other. And, and that's what it's going to come down to. So, and then Angelina tagging on that. If the patient comes in, and again, I think our patients are learning, reading, much more educated than maybe they were in the past, they may hear about the CD64. What are, what are you telling them? What does this mean for Guselcumab, for example? Yeah, I think it's important to listen to our patients, right? I mean, there's, they, we are helping them in their journey, and they're helping us to better understand what's happening. Um, there's no question about that. And how do you create that relationship with your patient and how do you talk with them and they want to trust us, we want them to trust us and get information from us. But how do you say, well, do we fully understand if there's going to be differences between the mechanisms? Why are we thinking about this? And But we want to also build trust that we will listen to what they are saying and why they're asking for something in particular. Great. And then I guess just the final question, these are all aisle 23s, right? Yes. Uh, aside from the CD64, as far as we know and what you presented, anything else distinguishing, or uh, is it really that CD64 with Giselcumab? I think as far as we know right now, this has sort of been the main standout in terms of how, you know, at least at the molecular level, we're, we're distinguishing some of these. I think in practice, the main differentiator, I think, is a bit about administration, ease of administration um, and insurance, unfortunately, ease of getting the, the drug. I think from a clinical standpoint, if you do look at the efficacy that has been presented in phase three trials, they all do look very good. They all seem to work. And so, again, I think if a patient came to me with this question, I'd ask, like, why are you worried about that? But um, I think this has the potential to say, okay, does Gaselcomab have this dual action and is this going to boost efficacy? And maybe there's a subset of patients where that's really going to be potentially beneficial. Great. So, Ed, maybe we can um, transition to the next slide and next topic and okay. kind of go through some of the evolution of the IBD treatment landscape. I think Jess did a really nice job of focusing on IL-23. Let's step back now and maybe give us the historic perspective in terms of 1998 to really current time, what's the landscape looking like? Sure, so I think it was um, September of 98 that um, infliximab was approved for Crohn's disease. Um, later, what was it, 2005, it got approved for ulcerative colitis, and a couple of years after that, we started seeing approvals of adalimumab, sertilizumab, later on, golimumab, et cetera. But really wasn't until 2014 that we saw um, a big development, which was the approval of vetalizumab for both um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, the first anti-integrin. Technically, I guess natalizumab was the first anti-integrin for Crohn's, but rare, rarely used anymore in IBD. A uh, couple years later, ustekinumab, the first anti-IL-12-23. Then two years after that, we saw the first JAK inhibitor, tofacidinib, approved for ulcerative colitis. And you can see that there's just been this incremental um, increase in uh, the number of medications that are approved. We had our first S1P receptor modulator in 2021 during the pandemic. Um, 2022 was a busy year. We had bupatacidinib for ulcerative colitis and rizinkizumab for CD. So here's our first anti-IL-23 approved for any of the IBD indications. And then last year was also a busy year, right? We had upatacidinib and Crohn's, etrazomod, the second S1P in ulcerative colitis, and then miracizumab, which is the first anti-IL-23 approved for ulcerative colitis. So we're in the, uh, we're in the, the land of uh, anti-IL-23s now, and we, we, we suspect that this year, later this year, we're going to see more approvals for anti-IL-23s. And so... Um, it'll be a, a busy year. And then, Ed, before you go on, just go back a slide. So sure. I know Angelina will go through this, but just for the audience, what are the two IL-23s approved now, and what is their indication, just to clarify that? I know it's on the slide. Yeah, so it's, uh, so Rizinkizumab um, is approved for Crohn's disease, and Miracizumab is approved for ulcerative colitis. Um, we have other drugs waiting in the wings, and we also have each of those drugs 
to be approved for the other IBD subtype in the quasi near future, near to intermediate term future. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's going to be a busy year and into next year. Okay, so let's, we're going to walk through some of the data. We're going to start with Crohn's disease and talk about each of the anti IL 23s and then we'll go through ulcerative colitis. So we had a phase two trial that was published a couple years ago in gastro for uh, guzelcumab in Crohn's disease, the Galaxy One trial. And this was an interesting trial design. It's not a big trial, it's only 50 patients in each arm, but patients were randomized in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one fashion to either placebo, three different doses of guzelcumab, and this was given IV every four weeks for three doses. So that was either 200, 600, or 1,200. And then the fifth arm, which was interesting, was a quasi-comparative arm using ustekinumab, using the standard weight-based induction dose of ustekinumab. And what the trial showed, and the light blue, by the way, is the clinical remission. So I'm going to tend to focus on the remission, not the response here. But what you see is that all, the, all three guzelcumab doses did pretty well. They did significantly better than placebo. And if you look at those deltas, the combined is 53 minus 16. So what is that? That's a 37% delta for induction. That's pretty good. Um, and then compare that to ustekinumab. They're sort of in the ballpark, maybe numerically, guzelcumab's a little bit better, but I think this was uh, important data to show proof of concept that anti-IL-23s uh, work in Crohn's disease. Um, then we had a follow-on to that, the maintenance arm of these studies, and these patients weren't re-randomized, so by study design, the patients on the lowest dose of guzelcumab were randomized to 100 milligrams sub-Q every eight weeks, and then the higher two doses of guzelcumab were randomized to a dose that was actually four times bigger, right? So it was 200 milligrams every four weeks. And you can see that, um, and then the ustekinumab patients were continued on ustekinumab, the standard dose. The placebo responders stayed on placebo. The placebo non-responders went on ustekinumab. And again, focus on the, the dark blue uh, uh, bars here, but you can see that the guzelcumab all did pretty well. It looked like that maybe the, the, the 200 and the 600 did a little bit better, um, and then ustekinumab was in the ballpark, maybe numerically slightly lower, um, but again, showing proof of concept. Now, um, some of you may know that at the late breaker session on Tuesday morning, we're going to see the results of guzelcumab phase three, and that's all I can say about it legally right now, but Tuesday morning, late breaker session, you're going to see the phase three data of guzelcumab in Crohn's disease. All right, so let's move on to risinkizumab. Remember, risinkizumab is the first right now and the only uh, drug approved for Crohn's disease in anti-IL-23. So um, remember, there were two induction studies that fed into the maintenance study. Advance was a combination of patients who had failed conventional therapy versus as, as half and half, roughly, and biologic therapy. And you can see that both induction doses uh, were about the same, and they were significantly better than placebo. And then the Motivate induction study was just the biofailures, and you can also see uh, pretty good results there. Both of the induction doses were fairly equivalent, and in the end, it was the 600 milligram uh, induction that, that got approved. And so then the second part, the, the clinical responders to the induction were re-randomized. So this is kind of like a, a, a maintenance, almost like a withdrawal study. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we'll show you that data. So here's the maintenance data, the fortified trial. This slide's a little confusing, so compare the green bars first. That's the clinical remission, and you can see that for um, uh, the IV induction only, which is really like the placebo arm, 41% versus 55% and 52% in the risen kizumab. And you could say, well, that delta's not big, but I think most of us believe that since all these patients receive drug in induction, and this is a drug with a long half-life and a prolonged pharmacodynamic response, that 
that induction dose probably blunted some of the differences between uh, the placebo patients and the patients on the two different maintenance doses of rizinkizumab. And then you could see endoscopic response, maybe a more objective parameter, and then here you can see a bigger difference between the placebo arm and the two doses of rizinkizumab, about a 25% uh, delta. And so this drug, as, as I mentioned, is approved for Crohn's disease. Now, at ECHO this year, we got some of the results for mirakizumab in Crohn's disease, and this is the VIVID-1 trial. Now, this is, um, this is a different kind of a, a, a primary endpoint, right? So this is combining a week 12 endpoint with a week 52 endpoint. So the first primary endpoint was this one, which was clinical response by PRO at week 12 and endoscopic response by SESCD at week 52. And you can see that uh, the overall difference was about 29%. Uh, when you stratified that difference by whether or not they had failed a biologic, you can see they're fairly equivalent. Like maybe it's a little bit bigger delta in the biologic failures, but the top line numbers are, are, are about the same. And you can see here that the induction dose was 900 milligrams every four weeks times three doses, and then the, um, and then the um, maintenance dose was 300 milligrams sub-Q, um, every four weeks. So that's the um, first endpoint. The second endpoint was a PRO at week 12 and clinical remission. So here we have two clinical endpoints removing the endoscopic endpoint. And here you can see about a 26% delta overall. And then in the uh, non-biologic failure, um, the delta is about 21%. And in the biologic failures, interestingly, it's higher um, and it's, it's about roughly, what, 30, 31%, but the top line numbers are very similar. So let's move on to ulcerative colitis. Um, Guzelkumab, this is the phase two quasar. This is a little confusing because there's a phase two quasar and a phase three quasar, and we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, in, in this study, Patients were randomized to two different doses of guzelkumab, IV every four weeks times three doses, or placebo. And you can see that um, the green is the clinical remission. I'm going to focus on that. You can see about a 16% delta between uh, drug and placebo, and the combination is very uh, similar. And then um, going back here, um, you're going to see at the... IMIBD plenary session tomorrow afternoon, the results of Quasar Phase three maintenance. So if you want to see that data tomorrow afternoon at the IMIBD plenary session. Um, INSPIRE was the Rizinkizumab induction trial in ulcerative colitis. So here, um, and this was a Phase three trial. So here, patients were randomized to either 1,200 milligrams of rizinkizumab, so note the difference in the dose compared to Crohn's, which was 600, 1,200 here, at, you know, every four weeks times three doses versus placebo, and you're seeing about a 14% delta on the uh, remission. So recall that um, with Quasar, it was 16%. Here, it's about 14%. And then um, mirakizumab induction. So this is part of the Lucent 1 study. Uh, this has been published in the New England last year. And you can see about an 11% delta uh, between uh, study drug and placebo. And the dose here was 300 milligrams every four weeks. And then we had the uh, mirakizumab maintenance. So then the responders were re-randomized. And you can see the clinical remission 24% delta uh, for steroid-free remission, about a 23% delta, and endoscopic remission a little bit better at about a 27% delta. And, and this dose was 200 milligrams sub-Q um, every four weeks. And again, mirakizumab is actually approved for ulcerative colitis. So I, I guess before we go on, and, and first of all, there are a lot of questions coming in, so please keep them coming, either virtual uh, or in the room, and we can, we can go through this uh, a little bit. Ed, um, there are lots of different definitions, and if you need to click back or, or remind yourself, 
What was, how is <laughs> remission defined in Galaxy? So, you know, when we're thinking about comparing across trials, clinical remission in Crohn's, clinical remission in UC, there are oftentimes differences where sometimes it's symptom-based only, sometimes it's symptom and endoscopic. And I know Crohn's and UC might be a little bit different. Well, so and it's even more confusing, right, because the EU uh, regulatory agencies have a different uh, requirement for the Crohn's remission, right? It's a, it's a, um, the clinical remission is, is a um, combination of the abdominal pain score and the stool frequency score, whereas in the U.S., it's still a CDI score of less than 150. So that's what Galaxy, the phase two looked at was less than one. Less than 150, the traditional yeah. kind of endpoint that's been used in right. the U.S. for... Which is interesting because, right, that whole thing was stimulated by the FDA yeah. wanting a new endpoint, and then they decided, no, we'll, we'll, we want to go back to the CAI. All right. So, Angelina, as you, as you click back through to get back to your slides, I'm going to mm -hmm. ask just one more question. So from the virtual audience, uh, Jess, is there a difference, and I don't know the answer to this, I don't know if there is an answer, but would there be a difference in response based on a patient's IgG1 level, that is competition for the CD64 binding by other circulating IgG1 antibodies? So kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, and I think too, and you know, when you look at the FC gamma, specifically the CD64, we looked at high affinity binding specifically on those monocytes that we know are high IL-23 producers. So I think when you're specifically talking about this mechanism, I don't, I don't know that there's a ton of competition, but um, you know, there are many other receptors, of course, that would bind IgG1. So. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'll add, and, and many of you in the room are kind of asking these questions at these meetings, which I think is really good, is the concept of companion diagnostics, companion diagnostics in a way to have more precision medicine. So for example, to the person that asked the question, if there was a blood level of, say, IgG1 that correlated with better response to a certain therapy, wouldn't it be nice to draw that blood level and say, this is the medicine we will use? We talk about precision medicine. Right now, just as a blanket editorial statement, we don't really have many biomarkers that are reliant in terms of companion diagnostics, but many of these studies and many of these drugs are starting to look at that. So I think the next phase will include these biomarkers and companion diagnostics. And Jess, I agree. I don't think there's anything yet, but we'll see over time. So Angelina, let's, let's take it back for the final section to clinical implications in practice. Uh, and then we'll have a, just a brief discussion, but then we will open it up for other questions, getting a lot that are coming in online. But tell us maybe step back. How yes. do you put this all together? I always said that my job is to be the translator. <laughs> so we have these wonderful ideas and then we have to translate it and how do we do practice? And I always said I'd love to, that, that's the job I love. So I actually really appreciated this slide a lot to kind of, I would say this slide, this is a combination of both the um, IOIBD stride two guidelines and also the spirit guidelines. But what's nice about this, I would say, is it, it, this is meant to keep us honest. This is meant to keep us kind of focused on eyes on the prize, eyes on the goal and what we are doing for our patients, you know, hopefully every day and all the time. Thinking on the left-hand side, kind of walking across from left to right, if we think now, it's really important. I think it's been, it's been really hammered into us that it's really important to take the early therapeutic window of opportunity when a patient is newly diagnosed with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and apply the right medication at that time. And that concept will hopefully change the entire disease course that we have and prevent all of these long-term complications, dysplasia, cancer, mortality, things that we are dealing with at tertiary IBD care centers. And I think that really helps us. How we do it is everything in the middle, right? Tight monitoring, making sure we get a, we're trying to get our patients into clinical remission, thinking about using our biomarkers, you know, for CRP and fecal calprotectin, and really making sure we're looking back to find that there's mucosal healing or at least mucosal response and optimizing our therapies as well. But the next step is really beyond that is where spirit came in, and it's really thinking about how do we impact quality of life. Our patients ask us these questions every day in clinical practice all the time. They may not be saying, 
They, they may not be saying, am I in endoscopic remission? They may or may not even understand that. I, how many times have you had patients ask you, what does remission mean? They may not even understand what remission means, and their definition of remission is different than our definition of, re, of remission as a provider, as a clinician. Um, and I think that's just, again, keeping us honest about what are we doing and how are we helping to treat our patients and how are we helping them to get to, get them to feel better, right? It's looking at them from a state of, illness and taking them to a state of wellness, and that is a whole person approach. So this is the cheater slide that was probably meant to be up front in, this is the, this is like the glossary index on, on where we are and what we're gonna be talking about. Um, and we've already talked about this, which are uh, FDA approved, Mirakizumab is FDA approved currently for ulcerative colitis, um, and Rizinkizumab is FDA approved for Crohn's disease, and the others are investigative, um, although, there was a, there has been, Mirakizumab's been filed now for um, Crohn's disease, so we will hopefully be hearing about that in the, in the future as well. In Actually, the if you could go back to that slide, there oh, are please. two questions, and I'll, I'll ask you um, one of them, and then, Ed, I think there was one that was kind of relevant to you. So looking at this slide, one of the questions is, how will Gaselkumab be administered in ulcerative colitis? So how, for induction, are we using Gaselkumab? Uh, and again, I think that we're seeing here, this is an intravenous administration at zero, four, and eight weeks. And then there will be a maintenance. And again, as Ed said, kind of stay tuned, you'll see more data. But just to give what I think is obvious, there's a subcutaneous maintenance uh, that you'll see with Giselkumab. So I think I just wanted to leave this up here. The other one was, Ed, this is for you, uh, one of the audience, and. You can answer this carefully when the question came in. When will Gaselkumab be FDA approved? Uh, when's, when's a sense? And maybe speak in broad terms, because as Angelina just pointed out, those that have an asterisk on the slide are not currently FDA approved. So really just Mirakizumab and Rizinkizumab. But when will Gaselkumab be FDA approved? Again, like, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's going to be um, for at least one of the indications later, like at the end of this year, like the end of the calendar year or sometime in the fourth quarter. Um, but like, again, I don't want to be quoted on that. And the other, the other thing to note is Rizinkizumab for UC uh, could be approved as early as next month. Uh, so th there's a lot happening in the field. Yes. Yeah. And the, re the reason we always squirm when we answer these questions is we don't really know, and it's somewhat up to the FDA. So we, we've right. seen medicines where we think they're going to be approved in the next three months, and then there's a delay longer. But I think that it's fair to say for one of the indications, we think in 2024 we'll see Gaselkumab uh, approval. So uh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. And so now we, we really touched on this, I think, already. So looking back at Quasar, Gesalkimab, and ulcerative colitis, the phase two study, looking at, um, looking at this, at, it's important to think in terms of are the patients, have they been exposed to biologics previously uh, or advanced therapies, um, and how many have not? So in this case for Quasar, there was a history of inadequate response or intolerance to one or more advanced therapies in 47% of the patients. And I think that really is nice to say almost 50% of the patients, because in clinical practice, what we have to translate is, how are we going to use this in clinical practice, and how does that, is it going to work for our patients? Do we expect it to work in a certain way for biologic naive patients or advanced therapy naive versus those who are experienced. Similarly, when we think in terms of Lucent 2, this is Mirakizumab again, and looking at this now stratified um, according to biologic or toposidinib failure status um, for ulcerative colitis. So on the left-hand side, you have those that, are, uh, that have been exposed to Mirakizumab, and you can see, really, I was struck by the same thing you'd mentioned previously, is that the deltas are really, you know, the delta looks a little bit better um, for the biologic TOFA failure on the left-hand side when it comes to clinical remission. On the endoscopic remission side, there really is no difference primarily in delta. There's about a 30% difference in delta between those who are biologic or TOFA uh, naive versus failure. And I think that's kind of an interesting concept when, of what we're seeing. 
When it comes to Inspire, this is now Risen Kismet Endpoints. The terminology is different, but the concept is the same. This is um, non-advanced versus advanced therapy, um, inadequate response for ulcerative colitis. So looking at this again, but what you're really, um, what you're seeing now is this is clinical remission at week 12, so you're not seeing response, you're only seeing remission. And when you look across these, you always, whereas we change the studies to the point, changing the studies, you might be changing endpoints. So sometimes it's really hard to think in terms of how do these compare apples to apples because we're showing that this is being shown a little bit differently. Um, but this is the same, this is still clinical remission at, at week 12 here. Um, and you see these nice deltas um, between uh, all the groups here. Um, overall and um, non-advanced uh, and advanced uh, intolerance or lack of response. So when it comes to other measures, and we think in terms of quality of life, I alluded to this before, thinking in terms of you know, whole patient and holistic care for our patients in the sense of treating all the different symptoms that a patient might have. I thought it was really interesting and nice to actually see these other pieces of clinical data, thinking in terms of fatigue um, and how are we helping our patients to get past this because this is, a, this is a big problem that our patients bring up with us quite often, that they're very tired. And what's interesting looking at Gesulkimab here is that in the trial they were looking at patients and as they're doing their patient diaries, they were seeing from baseline to treatment, and you can see overall, if you look just at the bottom row, what you'll see is the overall, and then it's broken out between um, non-advanced therapy, um, inadequate responders, and advanced therapy, inadequate responders, and you'll see this really um, impressive, I think, imp improvement in fatigue scores across the board. So our patients are feeling better, maybe not surprisingly when we're better controlling probably inflammation as well, but that's one component to it. Now, if you look also at gesalkimab again, now we're looking at, again, patient-reported outcomes, and we're thinking in terms of abdominal pain and urgency scores. So on the left-hand side, um, again, looking at um, patient-reported responses, for those who had abdominal pain at baseline, it's looking to, it, they were able to measure in terms of patient's improvement. So on the left-hand side, you have clinically meaningful improvement of abdominal pain for patients who had abdominal pain at baseline. 52% improvement there um, for about a 19% delta against placebo. And then next to that, you have resolution, complete resolution of abdominal pain in patients that did have abdominal pain at baseline. Um, and there again, you have almost a, a fifth of your patients, um, you know, or a fifth of the patients in the study that had resolution of abdominal pain. And bowel urgency has gotten a lot of airtime, which is kind of fantastic in a lot of ways because our patients do mention this to us, or maybe they're actually not mentioning it to us and they're embarrassed to mention it to us, but it's nice to bring this to the forethought and have these conversations about urgency. And this particular study looking at, um, this aspect of the study looked at a couple of different measurements. It looked at symptoms of bowel urgencies, so the need to quickly get to the bathroom or urgently get to the bathroom in time. It also looked at how impactful urgency was in impacting their life. And then it used a composite score on the right-hand side to look at both urgency and the impact of, of urgency on their life. Um, and that was the composite, composite measure all the way over on the right-hand side. And looking at patients treated with the Kisalkimab, almost 20% of those patients were really seeing in, a nice reduction in, um, in their urgency scores, which again, seeing these deltas, I think, and understanding uh, what an improvement this can make on people's day-to-day -day life. And this is what keeps patients home. This is what prevents them from socializing, from going out, from being able to participate. Um, this is, bowel urgency is really one of the most um, troubling some symptoms. Rizinkizumab did something even more. When I looked at this, when I looked at this for the first time, I was like, this is a lot of endpoints. But I think what's great about this is just is just being able to have these have these ideas that these endpoints are possible and the clinical trials can include these important endpoints where it comes to abdominal pain, urgency, tenesmus. You can read across the board, and the ones to look at are really um, those with the stars after them or those that are clinically significant. And so even if you just kind of glance across at the bottom, you see comprehensive symptom resolution, which is the scoring of all of these composites together, um, and you'll see how there is this um, improvement between the groups of those treated with an IL-23 um, and those that were treated with placebo. And there again, I think the overall impact that we, um, that we can have in many important areas for our patients is really um, welcoming. 
And then what about fatigue when it comes, this is fatigue now and bowel urgency again with the Mirakizumab trial. Um, this is going back to Vivid One. And this is looking for Crohn's disease, so it's kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, this here is looking at the facet fatigue score. And what's different about this that um, when you look at this is a higher score is actually equivalent to an improvement in quality of life. So it's different than what we might somewhat think, and you'd think of a higher number as being, you know, worsening situation. That's not, that's not the case here. So the higher number actually meant that there was improvement, there was a greater improvement um, in patients treated with mirakizumab compared to those that were treated with placebo on the left-hand side. And then your urgency score is using the urgency numerical rating score, which actually looked at, specifically looking at um, urgency, not just as a yes-no binary answer, which might be how we ask our patients in practice that we say, are you having urgency, yes or no, but this actually used a numerical rating scale for patients to really tell us the severity in which they were having urgency, and you can actually see the reduction over time um, as well within the MIRI trial. And again, I think it's kind of helpful just to see these quality of life endpoints that can really, you know, again, help our patients. Great. So before we get into a bit of a panel discussion and answer this question, we're getting a lot of questions on positioning. So for Jessica, Ed, Angelina, just think about how you'd answer this. When would you use IL-23 first? That's kind of a question that's coming up. But a lot of people are asking about combination therapy, and just to redefine that, I think the historic perspective on combination therapy was in the TNF era with combination of immunomodulators, azathioprine, 6-MP. I think that's evolved in our understanding now when we refer to combination therapy as really combination of two advanced therapies. So what I'd like to do, because there are so many questions, is I only have three or four more slides, and then we're going to stop, and we're going to have a discussion, go through as many questions as possible. For those in the room, uh, feel free to raise your hand, stand up, uh, a mic can come around, or if you speak loudly enough, we can repeat the question. But the considerations for combination therapy have now really evolved into what we would consider independent MOAs, mechanism of action. So drug A and drug B work through two different mechanisms. Then kind of this medium activity overlap crosstalk, complementary MOAs, high activity overlap. I think most of us, to be quite honest, when we think about combination, it's using two different MOAs, a TNF inhibitor with an IL-23, an Integrin with a TNF inhibitor, et cetera, et cetera. So using two different mechanisms of action. And there are a number of combination trials. In fact, at this DDW, there are some uh, studies that you'll see in the next day or two in combinations. But just to give you some example, there are several studies looking at the combination of IL-23 and TNF. And maybe in our discussion, we'll each kind of give our anecdotal experience with which medicines would we combine, which would we not, and look at that. But Vega and the two duet studies in CD and UC really are looking at this. And then there is a, a study that's already been uh, reported out, the anti-integrin, anti-TNF methotrexate, the Explorer study. And just to give you the punchline up front, I think we're going to see this from all. When we combine different mechanisms of actions, we are probably going to see higher rates of efficacy in combination of these uh, therapies question will come up is, can we get this FDA approved? Uh, or, sorry, can we get this actually approved by the insurance? Mm -hmm. So this is the Vega study, and, and Angelina, there was going to be a question for you about combining TNF and Gaselkumab, so I figured we would just go ahead and show that there is a study called Vega looking at golimumab compared to Gaselkumab as two separate arms, and then you can see at the bottom a combination arm of golimumab and Gaselkumab. And then you can see that these then, after the induction phase, uh, uh, essentially go to a maintenance monotherapy phase. And just to give you my editorial comment, when I talk to insurance companies about today getting two medicines, different mechanism of action combined, I actually ask them for six months. So usually I'm adding on a second therapy. Interestingly, this is kind of what's being done here, using two medicines together for a period of time and then de-escalating to monotherapy. 
So how did this look? And I think numerically, if you look from left to right, combination therapy, galimumab and gaselkumab on the left, and then the galimumab monotherapy in the middle, gaselkumab on the right, and the two separate bars for each are different time points, week 12 and week 38. And I think what you can see here is that the combination therapy has the highest in terms of efficacy. And again, we'll need more data over time, but this is pretty promising. So how do we translate all of this now into um, clinical practice? So maybe this is where we have uh, time to go through your questions. I'll start to read them off here, but uh, as we go through these, if you want to raise your hand or if you do want to stand up, please uh, uh, shout out and we'll, we'll call on you. Uh, so Jess, maybe I'll start with you because this is an insurance question and I oh, think good. we've 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 all fielded these before. So I've kind of given you my editorial prelude, but how do you think insurances will react to the concept of combination? Um, and then the comment that was made is, although there are benefits, the person uh, writing this said, they have a hard time imagining insurance companies are gonna approve this. So where are we today? What's been your experience? And then maybe the future. Yeah, I think you are right to be skeptical about that experience because it is still challenging. I think as of today, this is something that we are all doing, but I think we're finding ways to sort of work in within the system. I think I'm gonna use the six months. I, I learned that from you at this meeting. I think often what I do is, well, there's two strategies, right? You have to think you're, not, you're probably gonna have better luck pairing something that's oral or sub-Q with something that's IV, because those go through two different arms of the insurance company, as opposed to say two IVs. And so often you can get through induct, you know, IV induction and then sort of decide which one you're gonna peel off. Sometimes if you're not prescribing both, perhaps the patient also has concurrent psoriasis or uh, you know, joint uh, arthralgias, you can partner with a rheumatologist or a dermatologist, they prescribe one, you prescribe the other. Um, and so there are some sort of tricks to get around the system. And so that's what we have tend to be doing. I think now that we're getting some data, the insurance companies always lag behind what the data is anyway, but it does sort of help you with your appeals. But I think what we're starting to see is potentially down the road, some of these might be one agent in combination with each other, so it'll only be one approval. And I think that's ultimately where this field is going. Yeah, and I'll, I'll comment on that. There, there are co-formulations that are being developed. We didn't present that tonight, and, and we don't have data yet, but what that means is, and what Jess is saying is correct, imagine two agents combined as one IV or two agents combined as one sub-Q, or two agents combined as one pill. So it's coming as one administered medication. Once that's regulatory approved, then I think that will unlock the potential mm -hmm. for these combination approaches. I guess, Ed, um, maybe I'll ask a question a bit differently because there are a number on combinations. What two medicines today are you not recommending combination and any tricks you're using for insurance? <laughs> Probably the one combination I haven't used is a jack with a TNF, yeah. but pretty much right. every other permutation mm -hmm. I've done, mm -hmm. like it, you know, we'll do jacks and IL-23 or IL-1223, we'll do uh, anti-integrin with a TNF, we'll do anti-integrin with an interleukin, uh, I've done, yeah, interleukin with a TNF, so all those permutations yeah. I've done. Um, and. So get, get back to the insurance approval. Now that we're actually seeing like systematic reviews come out about combining therapies, that gives you a little bit of extra leverage. And just like uh, Dr. Allegretti alluded to, if you, can, if you can quote a paper, that gets you a long way in, yeah. in battling the insurance company. Yeah. You usually need two sources for yeah. our, we are fortunate enough at UC San Diego, we have pharmacists embedded in our practice. So we've been using combination therapy for about five years and combination advanced therapies for about that long. Um, and that is all these same tricks are the same ways to get them approved. But two papers uh, are really, that usually is what we need. Yeah, and I think to keep it real and keep it fair, we're also in, um, and again, I don't know where all of you practice, but we're in tertiary, quaternary yes. centers. So we are maybe able to get these approved. Okay. However, um, even with that, I will tell you many times, we will get pushback from the insurance company. Yes. 
And even though we cite two papers, yes. what Jess said is kind of the, the message I send the medical director of the insurance company is give me six months. This is usually a patient who's actually been through a couple of therapies already. And if the medical director hears, look, after six months, if they're not responding, uh, we're not going to keep them on combination. There is a cost to this. I don't want to underestimate that. So I think we also need uh, to be sensitive uh, to that. Angelina, qu a question that came up, nothing to do with IL-23s. Where are you positioning vedolizumab? Where do you use vedolizumab? Um, maybe in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. How are you using that? Yeah. Where are you positioning that? Yeah. It's a great question. All the questions about positioning are always great. Um, and it's great to hear everyone's responses too because we learn. Um, for ulcerative colitis, we're using it a lot for our moderate ulcerative colitis um, patient. I think it's a, you know, first line therapy is a very helpful place to use it. Um, we've, you know, and, and I think we have a lot of, you know, experience there. And I think that's, uh, I think that works well. Um, in patients also with some comorbidities where you really are thinking in terms of, I would say efficacy still, you know, sometimes I really get hung up on this efficacy versus safety conversation and like we're placing so much emphasis on, on safety, but you have to control the disease, right? Like it's just, you have to control the disease and making a decision about a safer medication doesn't actually, um, isn't necessarily, a, it, not promoting safer outcomes if the drug, if the drug is not controlling the disease and if the disease is still out of control. So I think that I just always want to, highlight that piece of the puzzle because I think it's worth saying when we get this opportunity up here. Um, and in Crohn's disease, I think probably preferentially, um, we are using it a bit in Crohn's disease. I'm probably preferential for Crohn's colitis in some ways, um, you know, before an anti-TNF if that's the route that we need to take. Yeah, I think globally, Vito, I would use, if, if you use it, use it first line, certainly for ulcerative colitis maybe more preferential for Crohn's of the colon. However, there are data that it works on small bowel Crohn's. Yep. Uh, Jess, I'm going to ask you a question about safety of IL-23, and then Ed, just to start thinking about this, what about the combination of GLP-1 and an IL-23 <laughs> in patients who have metabolic syndromes or obesity? So I'll, I'll let you kind of ponder that. But Jess, we didn't... Um, you know, the question specifically is the safety of Gaselkumab, but then there were some others about IL-23s. Maybe as you think about IL-23s, what's the safety profile? How's that looking? Yeah, I, I would say excellent. You know, I think Vito has already always been sort of touted as the safest advanced therapy, but I think when we look at this class, I think it's right in line with Vitalizumab. I think it's incredibly safe. We're not seeing any major safety signals really from any of the programs. So I think across the board, they all look to be quite good. So I have no... You know, there are no populations to which I would avoid these agents. Yeah, and I think to, to say this a different way, there's not, we're not seeing the boxed warnings. We're not seeing the blood clots, the mace, the opportunistic infections, the malignancies. Um, it seems to be a very clean class. It's not free. It's not 0%. I would never tell a patient that. Um, but generally, we're, we're seeing good safety. So there, there are a lot of, I know at um, this uh, DDW, there's a lot on obesity, the obesity medicines. Obviously, every day we're hearing more and more. But there is a concept in um, patients who are obese that maybe they're going to be more refractory to therapies. Maybe it's right. the adipocytes and TNF. But what, how, how are you thinking about, I know at Mayo, you're probably seeing patients who are on GLPs and on uh, an IL-23 or therapy. Kind of talk this through your, your thoughts today. Right, so you, you already alluded to it. There's, there's pretty you know, emerging data that the higher your visceral abdominal fat, the less likely you are to respond to um, advanced therapies. And um, there's also this observation, um, obese patients often have a high CRP, regardless of the status of their IBD. Um, Anecdotally, I've seen some interesting uh, observations where patient, like the only thing you've done is put them on a GLP agonist, and, and all of a sudden their CRP goes from like 37 to 7. Literally saw one last week. Um, so um, I have no concerns about using those in combination. And um, yeah, so actually one of my younger colleagues, Amanda um, Johnson, um, has done some studies that we actually have a protocol with the surgeons between step to one and step two of an IPAA to put patients on a GLP-1 to try to get them to lose weight to, to optimize them for surgery. So, 
Yeah, I think um, probably, actually by show of hands, who have patients on GLP-1s at all have you seen in your practice? Not that you're prescribing yeah. it, but so we're seeing hands are going up. I mean, I think this is something we're gonna see more and more. The, the other concept is there, there may be benefit on GI function. I'm not necessarily an inf saying inflammation, although there's some question about that with the GLP-1s, but there is also a motility effect. So there may be some patients who are having that uh, response as well. Um, Angelina, S1P, where do you position that? And then Jess is gonna ask you the common question of sequencing for Crohn's and sequencing for ulcerative colitis. I think the S1P data is probably strongest in the bio-naive patient uh, population for ulcerative colitis, and so um, I, I will admit, we, I don't have a large number of patients I'm seeing that are really bio-naive. Usually in, in our center, we're seeing the refractory or ones that are coming from referral center, you know, or coming from community and coming into the referral center. Um, we have, interestingly, uh, have some experience using it, though, where Patients had had a response maybe to vedolizumab and then lost response and then cycled through all the other medications and now we're coming, coming back again. And it's been interesting to see some of those patients responding to the S1P there, which is not what you would, I know, right? Like, I, it, it's not necessarily what you would expect, but it, we've had some success in those situations and it was surprising. It was not, so it's been interesting. Small numbers, so, you know, but interesting. And then I guess uh, just to tag on to that, thinking about Crohn's and you see sequencing, I know that could be a 30 minute talk, but just kind of briefly, how do you approach that? Okay, I would say my sort of Cliff Notes version of how I think about this is, and this is for both diseases. Is my mic all of a sudden off? Um, I think about, when I, with both diseases, I think about has this patient earned an anti-TNF? Are they sick enough to require an anti-TNF? You know, in Crohn's, is this a perianal patient? Do they have a more disease phenotype? And an ulcerative colitis patient, is this pancolitis, very sick, um, high CRP, et cetera? Then I'm starting with infliximab. And if I'm not, then really everything else is on the table. So when you see, then I, you know, you're sort of thinking about vedolizumab, S1Ps, or ustekinumab, and now miracizumab. Um, and so uh, I would say, still though, probably nine out of 10 times, it's still vedolizumab in that situation as my first line for those who I don't feel need an anti-TNF. Um, and then on the Crohn side, if the patient, I don't feel that the patient needs an anti-TNF, um, again, basically everything is on the table, but for me, nine out of 10 times, it's an IL-23 is where I start. And you, you kind of answered a, a question, where would you use IL-23 first line? Um, Ed, and um, we popped up a new slide. How do you optimize an interdisciplinary team approach? There are a number of people asked the question on, should all IBD patients see an IBD specialist? Now you can define that in, in different ways, um, or at least a gastroenterologist. So there are certain pockets of the country, obviously, where access to specialty care is limited. Um, but what do you think in terms of the team approach? What does that look like? Uh, when should an IBD specialist be a patient referred to? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes you'll, like, we treat this, these groups monolithically, and in real life, there, there's, it's a continuum of, um, of expertise or familiarity with problems. So I don't think you need to necessarily see an IBD specialist um, for, first off. I think the average gastroenterologist, the average GI APP can uh, manage um, the typical IBD patient. I think it's when the patient has like failed a couple of therapies or, or has had unusual complications. That's maybe when you want to get the expertise of somebody who maybe just sees IBD all the time. But I think the average IBD patient can be managed. Yeah, when you look in the United States, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet most of you are treating IBD. Most of you may not be in a quaternary center as an IBD only physician. And the majority of IBD, at least in the United States, is not being cared for by an IBDologist at a specialized center. So I completely agree with what you said. The only other thing I would add is, Sometimes referrals come when there needs to be a surgery or a pouch surgery, and there's not necessarily a surgeon maybe in that area who specializes in IBD surgery. And that would be a time, I think it behooves all of us 
to even if it means traveling a bit, to have the patient see ideally a colorectal surgeon who has experience in IVD. For the bread and butter, ileal resection, I, I actually think uh, many of the general surgeons do a good job, but any of the pelvic surgeries, the pouch surgeries. Um, so we're gonna go through a couple of these SMART goals, uh, and then I'll have a few housekeeping notes. The questions are still coming in. We might have a few minutes at the end. We will end on time at eight, so we won't go over eight, but the SMART goals refer to specific, measurable, attainable, relevance, timely. So consider the underlying mechanisms behind the inflammatory pathways. Uh, we spent a good bit of time and just did a really nice job outlining mm -hmm. the impact of IL-23 and the TH17 pathway. Uh, she also outlined the differentiation between IL-23 targeted therapies, some of the unique characteristics, this concept of CD64, and the increasing utilization of clinical data from treatments targeting IL-23 when we're thinking about positioning and planning. So for additional resources, um, I think you heard this earlier, but if you have your phone, uh, you can take it out and um, I'll leave this up here for a second uh, to, to use the QR code. And while I do that, um, I skipped over a few questions. Angelina, I'm gonna ask you about the team and kind of who makes up the IBD team in San Diego, um, what's that look like to you, that kind of whole person care that you referred to? Yeah. I think as many aspects as you can get is great. So our team is, um, is really like in clinic, it's physician and APP driven team. So when a new patient comes into our clinic to be seen for the first time, this is a luxury piece that I love, is that if I'm seeing a new patient, I'm also with one of my attendings, which is great. Um, for me, it's so fun because, you know, I'm, I jokingly say, like, sometimes the APP in one of the tertiary centers is like the IBD, you know, advanced IBD um, fellow that never graduates. You know, we're just, we just get to keep learning and keep learning and keep learning. And that, to me, is so much fun. But we get to do it together and kind of show that team approach all the way straight across. So using your nurses, your medical assistants, obviously, we have pharmacists embedded um, colorectal surgery. We need often a lot of times um, as well. Um, we are starting to get a dietitian, uh, which is better because I know other centers are, have it already embedded and that's been great. And then psychosocial support and care as well. So I mean, as many people as you can get. And then of course there's, when you need rheumatology and you need dermatology. And I mean, you could go on and on and on, right? And we're lucky to have um, like an expert um, radiologist who reads MRI and aerographies because that as I came, and you guys may, you will probably already know, but attesting to what that looks like and coming from a community practice setting, the MRI reads um, are different. And that has been um, a game changer. No, I completely agree. I guess, Jess, any other team members you're utilizing in Boston? Yeah, so I would say, for me, I think, I'm sorry. Similarly, I think there's like the, the home team, like the team that's within the clinic, and then we have some ancillary staff. Mm -hmm. So within our clinic, similarly, we work in a team-based approach. So we've got an APP has a certain amount of MDs on our team and one RN. So we, like, we, the, that team gets to know those patients very well. Um, we have a nutritionist and a psychologist embedded within our clinic also. Um, but then I think similarly, the colorectal surgeons are very much part of our team. They often will see patients in clinic with us. Um, I think similarly, the pathologists and the radiologists. So we do our multidisciplinary conference every other week where we all review the cases together and have them weigh in on what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then we, I think it's always good to have your point person in each of the subspecialties that we use. So our psychiatrists, our rheumatologists, and our dermatologists, who we always refer to. Um, and so those are sort of our ancillary team members. Yeah, and I think coming back to the question earlier, when to refer into a quaternary center, also there are times when it may be that, again, um, in the community, these teams may not be practical. And then the question is working with uh, regional sites. So the, the QR code, like I said, is we'll also unlock that 3D digital information. Um, the gastroenterology hub, there are free resources. So this is www.cmeoutfitters.com. Uh, and then to request and collect credit. So this actually, if you're in person, uh, it's on the left-hand side. So please take another second to take out your phone uh, in person on the left-hand side, the QR code to uh, collect credit on the right-hand side for those that are 
uh, listening in virtually. Uh, on the right-hand side is the uh, QR code. Um, Ed, uh, while people do that, and maybe in the uh, last few minutes, we'll, we'll have a couple questions, but anybody else on your team at Mayo Clinic? No, I think that um, that pretty much covers it. I think that the key is to have, like, like uh, Jessica said, is to have go-to people and especially like phone, like you said, phone a friend. Mm -hmm. um, so you can just get on the get on the phone or t text them. We now have like a chat thing in our Epic, and so you can, you know, chat people up and say, hey, I got this situation. What you know, what do you think? So it's just like having that network of people. So even if it's not like a formal team. You know, create your own team from your, you know, colleagues and other specialties. All right, rapid fire questions. Uh, Jess, aisle 23 in elderly, let's say over the age of 65, any concerns? No. Okay. Um, Ed, uh, in terms of aisle 23, rapidity of onset, is it fast? What are you seeing in your practice? I'd say it's pretty fast. I don't know, is it, is it as fast as a jack? I'm not sure, but it's pretty fast. So I think it's... It's not an issue, let's put it that way. And then Angelina, combining, I think you kind of said this already, there are a couple of questions on combining IL-23 with oral small molecules, so S1Ps or JAK inhibitors, any concern with either? Uh, no. Okay, and I think that's a, a take home message, is IL-23 probably, I think we all agree, we could combine. Ed, I do it, what you said. I have not used a TNF with a JAK inhibitor. That's the one uh, combination uh, I worry about. Question came up, Jess, I'll ask you this. Uh, patients being treated with um, IL-23 for their psoriasis doing exceptionally well, uh, but the patient actually then developed ulcerative colitis. Um, how would you manage? Would you take them off the IL-23, use something else, or would you add something for their ulcerative colitis? I think it's a good question. One, I'd look at the dosing. So yeah. they often dose differently in derm than we do. So there might be an, uh, the ability to dose optimize and see if you can sort of recapture in that patient. Um, but I would say uh, if that didn't work, then I would potentially... It's a good question. I, I think depending on how severe the ulcerative colitis is, and if this is their first agent, I'd probably work with the dermatologist to think about there are many other agents that that would potentially cover both. You know, so I would probably consider switching if their ulcerative colitis was really not getting well controlled before I jumped into combination therapy. Yeah, so Ed, Ed, would, <laughs> Ed with you, um, would you use uh, combinate, would you add on to the IL-23 or would you switch to something else and try to get both uh, controlled? No, I'd probably add on. What would you add? Yeah, what would you add? Uh, you could add Vito. Mm -hmm. All right, um, if a I, patient... What about reinducing? I mean, we didn't really... I think it's just an add-on to what Jess yeah. is already saying, too. Yeah, Jessica's already saying. So dose optimized, but then think even if they're already just on maintenance dose, do the reinduction, the UC induction dosing, and then you go, you know, and then you see how they do at that point, because that's only a couple more weeks. Great. One, no. thing, one thing we didn't talk about were levels. <laughs> oh, Ed, so oh, why are you bring this up? <laughs> All right, we'll just stop. No, go Wait, ahead. Do we need to talk about levels? So we need to talk about levels. levels for IL-23s, and we don't know. Uh, All right, there, gonna, there, is a, there is one lab in the U.S. that has risen Kizumab levels now. Is, is it at Mayo Clinic? Yeah, it is. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, so. quick, quick, quick yes, no. Be honest in answering this. No. Uh, do you use levels with IL-23? Okay. No. Do you use levels with TNF inhibitors? Yes. 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 Infliximab and probably adalimumab. Do you use levels with VDO? No. I used to, but I'm not as much anymore. You're just dose optimizing. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any levels currently for JAK inhibitors? No. No. All right. So. That was okay. a trick question. That was a trick question. That was a trick uh, question. Final question that comes up quite a bit since we're on aisle 23, and there are a number that I didn't get to that have the same theme. Um, Patients on IL-1223 ultimately loses response or does not respond. I'll ask just the question first. Patient does not respond at, at all to IL-1223. Would you use an IL-23? I would say the answer is potentially. Um, I think that depending on where they are in their treatment cycle, if I've got other options or other things to try, then I probably would try something else first. But if this was sort of 
end of the line, I would have no qualms about trying an IL-23. And then Angelina, if a patient loses response, they've done okay with an IL-1223, would you use an IL-23? Absolutely. Yeah, so no problems. Ed, patients on an IL-1223 used to kinumab. Today, patient starts to lose response. Are you trying to shorten the interval of the IL-1223 use of kinumab to every four to six weeks? Or are you just saying, you know what, I'm just going to switch to an IL-23? Yeah, I think it's, you know, you're going to case by case that if you, like, if you're getting a sense that there's like a breakthrough phenomenon, you might be more inclined to try bumping it up. Whereas if that patient just didn't, you know, respond like you're, you know, are you going to waste time and just move on? Yeah. And, the, and the waste time is the important part. So if, if it's a patient who tells you I've lost some response and you can get the approval for a shorter interval to see, I would do that. By and large, though, if they're losing response to IL-1223, with the insurance difficulties, at least that I've had, getting that approved every four to six weeks, I am switching them, as Angelina said, yeah. to an IL-23. So Angelina, Ed, Jess, thank you very much. Thank you to the audience, both in person and virtually. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks.